Hello and welcome to Valerie and Belize, the YouTube channel that is focused on helping you have the most amazing bucket list trip to Alaska, giving you all the information you need to plan your trip and to explore the rest of the American West. My name is Valerie. I am your host, and if you are tuning in live or watching the replay, this is part of my Alaska seminar series for 2023. So I write a ton about Alaska and I create Alaska travel videos, but for this new year, I decided to put together a series of videos with some of the destination partners that I've been fortunate to work with during my trips to let them give you all the information you need, both about visiting their trip any year and specifically what you need to know or what's new and noteworthy in 2023. Now, before we get started, uh, I want to say we're chatting about Ketchikan, and I'm very excited to have Patty Mackey with me. Um, she was at my video series a few years ago, but before we jump in, just want to do a land acknowledgement and express my gratitude for the excellent stewardship of the Clinket people for whom Ketchikan is part of their ancestral homeland. Uh, they are land stewards dating back to time immemorial, and if not for their stewardship, we would not have the amazing place that Ketchikan is to talk about today including all the natural beauty and resources it has to offer. So uh, expressing my gratitude in that acknowledgement. And as I said, we're gonna talk about Ketchikan, which is a fascinating place that you may be visiting as part of a cruise or perhaps on your own. And we're gonna probably talk about both different ways you can explore Ketchikan. So with that, I will bring Patty in and let her take over to tell us all we need to know. Thanks so much for joining me, Patty. Hi, Valerie. It's great to be back. Always a joy to sit and talk with you and uh, share Catch a Can with the world. Perfect. Let's jump right in. Let's start here. Well, I thought the map might be helpful if you're not familiar with uh, Catch a Can, and Valerie has offered to be my able assistant here. Uh, but Catch a Can Alaska is located in what's commonly called the Inside Passage or the Panhandle. Um, sometimes you might even think we're part of uh, British Columbia because we do uh, hug the, co the border there. Uh, in terms of distance, we are about 680 miles north of Seattle. We are about 800 miles south of Anchorage. Um, and as Valerie mentioned, there are several ways to visit Ketchikan. Like many communities in uh, Southeast Alaska, we are an island community, so you can only visit uh, by arriving by air or by sea. Uh, so that's what makes cruising so popular in our region. Um, however, you might not know that we are just a 90 minute flight from SeaTac Airport in Seattle. And that makes us a really easy place to uh, start your Alaska adventure and actually really get to enjoy the state um, in very little, very little time. Um, particularly for folks who are coming from the East Coast, uh, Alaska Airlines in particular offers many numerous you know, one uh, nonstop flights from the East Coast to Seattle, and then it's just a hop to catch a can. So you can really uh, make the most of your time off uh, visiting us uh, by air. Uh, cruise, of course, is another great way to come. We had roughly 42, 45 four different cruise ships that come through Ketchikan in the summer month and, you know, just about any cruise line you can imagine. Of course, traditionally Princess and Holland America, as well as um, Royal Caribbean Carnival, um, Disney is here, a number of specialty cruises like Windstar and uh, some uh, very small ship cruises such as Uncruise and Alaskan Dreams. So lots of opportunities and variety just a cruise for just about every taste and um, I, things that you might like to do on board. And then finally, the Alaska Marine Highway System is our state ferry. Uh, we call it a highway because it actually uh, travels to over 35 different coastal communities in Alaska and in areas where there is no uh, road or uh, much air support. This is how people come and go. So uh, the ferry system has been calling in Bellingham, Washington as its southernmost terminus and also Prince Rupert, British Columbia. Now that we're past COVID and the restrictions on traveling through Canada, uh, we're excited to have Prince Rupert back. Amazing. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So people can fly from SeaTac in just 90 minutes, which is incredible. Um, can you give us a little more detail on, is it daily flights year round? Is there seasonality in the flights? 
Absolutely. Um, we are served by Alaska Airlines uh, 365 days a year. And um, there are additional flights scheduled in the summer months. In fact, starting around Memorial Day, uh, we typically have three flights a day that come from Seattle uh, and two flights that come down from uh, Anchorage and three flights from Juneau. So, uh, and that's just uh, year round. And then to supplement that in the summer, uh, we'll have an additional flight that'll start up uh, over Memorial Day weekend or just before, and then by uh, July, which is really peak season, uh, we'll have another flight that's available. So lots of access. In addition, Delta also provides seasonal service to Ketchikan with a flight that uh, departs Seattle once a day. So for folks, again, that are in uh, key areas served by Delta, it's easier than ever now to get to Alaska and to Southeast. Amazing, okay. So let's move on. You had some basic info that people need to know about visiting Catch Camp. Yeah, just real quick. Um, I already talked about the uh, transportation options, uh, but if you're cruising directly from the Seattle area or even Vancouver, it's about 36 mile or 36 hours to transit um, because of tides and other things. And same for the ferry system. Uh, we also have a lot of private vessels that come up. Um, it's not unusual to see just amazing yachts, but also, you know, a typical 50 foot cruise boat that comes up, um, you know, and families like to travel that way. And there's so much opportunity for uh, uh, seagoing vessels <laughs> out of the Northwest. We get a lot of folks that come and visit us that way, too. And people come on their private airplanes as well. Um, we are four hours behind uh, Eastern time and an hour behind Pacific time. So uh, you will have some time adjustments to make there. And then just quickly, our overall population here uh, in the borough, we have boroughs instead of counties, is just under 14,000 people. Uh, that includes the island that Ketchikan is on, as well as uh, two additional islands where uh, that are part of the borough. And then the city of Saxman, or excuse me, city of Ketchikan, which is uh, Within the borough is about 8,000. And then Saxman, which is a Clinkett village about three miles south of the city of Ketchikan, uh, has about 355 people. Amazing. And um, just to give a little context, when we were looking at that map, Alaska's all one time zone. Yes. As big as it is. So, so Ketchikan's kind of on the eastern end of it. And then I can imagine that by the time you get out on the Aleutians, the daylight hours, uh, what time the sun rises and sets within that one hour time zone are dramatically different. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, amazing. Um, and we're all starting to enjoy the uh, extended daylight now. Um, I'm looking out my window right behind me. It's, uh, you still kind of getting dark around quarter to five or so, but it's starting to lighten up every day. We're excited about that. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about seasonality. Um, I know you said peak season is the summertime. Um, what is it like in the sort of shoulder seasons and what's it like in the winter? Okay. Um, I guess to start off with, um, in late April and May is what we would traditionally think of like the kind of the beginning of our spring. Um, that's when the snow starts melting from the higher elevations. And Ketchikan is uh, located in a very temperate area, so we don't get a lot of snow like you might expect uh, other places in Alaska to get. Uh, our weather is probably more comparable to the Pacific Northwest, Seattle, Portland area. Lots of rain. In fact, so much more rain than uh, Seattle, which of course has prided itself for years as being kind of a rainy city. Uh, but that's also part of the ecological system that means we have um, beautiful evergreens, lush forests, and of course, lots of salmon. Um, so you would enjoy what typically would be March weather, you know, but it's about a, five to six weeks later here. And then uh, it starts warming up. And then, of course, we get more daylight as the year progresses towards the summer solstice. Um, cruising has been starting earlier and earlier. So we have ships coming now as early as late April. Um, again, they recognize that with the spring weather, it becomes, um, more of a, um, uh, 
enjoyable cruise, if you will, uh, later in April. And then, of course, the ships are here now until um, through October, uh, with some ships staying even as late as around like the 20th of October. Um, and then, of course, the summer months, um, peak season is really June, July, August. And then there's uh, like fishing is great from uh, the end of May through September. Uh, we have five different species of salmon that run. So that's something that people can do just about any time if they come up in the summer season. Um, and then fall, we get into our kind of stormy weather, like a lot of places too around the U.S., uh, winter travel to Ketchikan is certainly enjoyable because it's a very intimate experience. Um, we are not a ski location or, you know, really an outdoor uh, activity area. But what we what we do have is a lot of cultural activities. Um, as Valerie mentioned, the Clinket people are the first people of this area. But we also have um, been very blessed with the presence of two additional tribal groups, the Simshian and the Haida, who are both originally from British Columbia and who for years and years traversed up and down the Inside Passage, trading with the Clinket people and then eventually settling in areas in and around the Ketchikan um, community areas. So uh, winter time means, um, it used to mean basketball. That's a big thing up here. Uh, a lot of basketball tournaments are played. We, the, our high school actually has one where they bring teams up from all over the U.S. to participate. Um, but it's also, as the, the Native people would traditionally do after they spent their summer hunting and uh, gathering fish and drying it and been, you know, picking berries and preserving all those foods for the winter time. Then when they're inside, that's when they have the opportunity to um, be artistic, whether it's uh, carving implements like, uh, you know, uh, bowls and weaving baskets, things that you would use in your household, to sharing stories and um, talking to the young kids about, you know, what, what their traditions would be. And um, uh, it's, and that kind of follows through in Ketchikan, you'll see a lot of arts activities going on. Uh, as well as an opportunity to just enjoy being with your family and um, kind of tucking in for the winter, if you will. I feel like in these seminars that I've done so far, in several of the, the cases, I've realized that that sort of late autumn, winter and spring season is actually a great opportunity if you are looking for really the really authentic experience, because it is so much less tourism, especially in the Southeast. I feel like, you know, um, Anchorage and Fairbanks still get plenty of tourism in the winter, but Southeast really does get nice and quiet. And so if you want to see what it's really like living there and have those more intimate experiences, it's a great time to visit for that. Yes. And, uh, you know, our local museums are open. The We have a really great facility here called the Totem Heritage Center, uh, which I can talk a little bit more about later if there's an interest. But, um, they offer traditional native arts classes so you can learn carving techniques, what it takes to create a Northwest Coast design, how to weave, um, uh, silversmithing and on and on and on. So uh, there's, and then in February throughout the month is what we call uh, Festival of the North and there are arts events, whether it's our wearable art show or, um, you know, uh, symphony performances and things like that, just about every weekend in the month of February. It's a great time to come up and check out the local talent and just kind of hang out with the locals. And potentially find some really neat souvenirs. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Perfect. Should we move on to the next slide? Yeah, let's, I think this one is kind of a list of all, oh, what's new? Okay. <laughs> I, uh, Let's talk a little bit about 2023, of course. Um, what's exciting for us, really, what's new is that we're pretty much done with all of the COVID restrictions that we had to deal with when it came to travel. So we're Alaska catch cans open and ready for business. Um, we never did entirely lose visitation. Of course, the cruise lines weren't here for uh, the better part of a year and a half, but because of the salmon fishing and because a lot of our lodges and re, uh, 
resorts are in remote areas and are in you know smaller groups of people those uh those were actually popular choices for people so we did see um continued visitation by folks that are interested in in going fishing um now everything's wide open all the tours will be operating this summer and i i shared this illustration with you because one of the more well-known artists to come from Ketchikan is uh, Ray Troll. Ray Troll has been designing uh, his whimsical characters. He puts them on t-shirts. He's uh, very well known for, you know, and his art posters and such. Um, he and his wife operate a gallery that's located right um, basically steps away from the entrance to Creek Street, which is our very famous wooden boardwalk area. And one of Ray's real interests is paleontology. He's a, you know, probably a student for life. And he uh, has a friend, Kirk Johnson, who is a, a, a real live paleontologist who works with the Smithsonian. And they have teamed up for years um, on books that they've written about prehistoric uh, animals and um, they've done several museum exhibits together all across the country and we're very excited because this summer Ray has brought one of his really popular exhibits home to the Tongass Historical Museum. So we will have Cruising the Fossil Coastline uh, exhibit that will be up beginning in March and running through September of uh, this year. It's going to be a great addition, a lot of fun for people to come and check out. So if you're coming to Catch Can, that's a must do um, because you'll enjoy thoroughly. And his shop is just steps away from the museum because it's also located right near Creek Street. So it'll be easy if you decide you just got to go buy a fossil or something. <laughs> you can do that with him. Very cool. Yeah, and we are really excited about uh, having this. Yeah, event. I don't know that I, I did. I know he's a very famous Alaskan artist because you see his work all over the state. Um, but I don't think I knew he's from Ketchikan. So that's exciting. He's bringing one of the exhibits home. Yeah, yeah. He's been a great ambassador for us. And um, again, his sensibilities are very ketchikan -y. Um He likes to take... Uh, pun, you know, like kind of does plays on words like, um, uh, let's see, he's got a lot of fishing um, and uh, marine themed shirts, but he will, like, if you must smoke, smoke salmon, for example, is <laughs> one of his famous spawn till you die is another one. Um, and then he takes other sayings that people might recognize and twists them around with a kind of a fishy and sometimes a fossil-y kind of a, a play on words. And so his artwork's popular and it's always fun. I'll be watching a show and all of a sudden I'll look and like, oh, this character's wearing a Ray Troll shirt. So that's um, how you know it's really an Alaskan show. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're not exactly. faking it when they know that detail. I would say I saw one of his shirts that I really liked. Uh, it was up in Seward. So it shows how wide the reach is on his work. It was um, Dungeness and Dragons like Dungeons and Dragons, but it was a big crab because exactly, uh, yeah. Dungeness crab in, in Alaska. Um, was there another slide you were expecting? I want to make sure we don't miss anything. Um, I thought I had posted a kind of a, you know, things to see and do, but I might not have. So is that the last one that you have? That's the last okay. one I have. Well, let's just okay. pop back to our faces so that people have something lovely to look at. Not that Ray's artwork isn't fantastic. Um, <laughs> if you want to see it, you got to go to Ketchikan. Uh, but yeah, please go. give us a rundown of things to see and do, uh, the kind of the basics and then the secret gems, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, I really, I really loved your land acknowledgement at the beginning of the program because it really speaks to a lot of what Ketchikan is able to offer. Um, so let's talk about the stewardship. Um, we are very fortunate that we are we live within a coastal rainforest. Uh, it is the Tongass National Forest and the largest one in the United States at over 16 million acres. Um, pretty much everywhere you go in the Inside Passage, you are going to be surrounded by the forest. And so the recreation and um, 
adventure opportunities for people uh, really make, I think, Ketchikan and, and other locations too in Southeast stand out. Uh, of course, there's plenty of hiking opportunities um, and right in and around the community, you can hike Deer Mountain, which is a 3000 foot elevation mountain that sits right in the downtown area. Uh, we also have the Ward Lake Recreational Area, which is just about seven miles north of Ketchikan. And it offers um, oh, all kinds of uh, opportunities for hiking. There's um, uh, picnic tables and there's also uh, camping ground, campgrounds for people if they decide they want to stay there. Um, Ward Lake is itself a beautiful lake, but it's also near Ward Creek. And so um, that trail is beautiful as well as the Perseverance Trail, which is accessed at the Recreation Center. Um, we have a couple of state parks, uh, Settlers Cove, which is at about 18 miles north of Ketchikan and is on the beach and really one of my favorite places to go. I really love it out there because I'm a beach girl. I admit that I have been all my life. <laughs> and, uh, but the other state park we have is Totem Bight State Historical Park, and it's very unique in that um, it was chosen for a Conservation Corps project back during the CCC days, and uh, locals were put to work carving um, reproductions of totem poles that had started to uh, deteriorate. And so the federal government provided funds and jobs and put people to work doing just that. So now we have this gorgeous facility, very accessible, um, that is sits on the water in a really lovely location. And you can see examples of poles uh, that were originally carved, but have also been uh, now reproduced just because trees tend to kind of disintegrate and back into the ground eventually. So there's also a clan house um, out there that is something you can walk in and take a look at, um, either on a guided tour or on a self-guided tour. And the, it's also a popular place once a month for uh, native dance performances in the evening. So it's got a little bit of something for everyone. Um, to kind of expand on the activities, there's all kinds of outdoor activities that you can do in and around the forest, whether it's uh, kayaking, bicycle riding, um, We've got a lot of waterborne uh, tours and activities just because of our area. Uh, we have also some fun, you know, get in a Jeep and drive up a mountain road and see the views and also kind of learn a little bit about the forest. And so there's all those kinds of tours that are awaiting people that kind of tie into the land. And then the other kind of lesser known um, activities that people can participate in are uh, cabin rentals. In and around the Tongass are a number of uh, cedar cabins that were built by the Forest Service. You could rent them for roughly about $50 a night. They are bare bone cabins, so you do have to pack in your own food. We do have companies here in town that will actually um, outfit you with a kit that you can rent. So you can you know, rent sleeping bags and cooking gear and all of that. You just buy your groceries. And then the cabins are accessible either, uh, you can charter a boat to get out to them or uh, the cabins that are on lakes, you would wanna uh, fly out in a float plane. So if you're really looking for a getaway, um, something that is gonna take you into the heart of the, oh, the forest and um, get you away from you know, the everyday, that would be a great opportunity. Um, and then we have uh, so many native cultural activities and opportunities for people to enjoy. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, as I mentioned, we have Totem Bight State Park and there's uh, guided tours there daily as well as um, the opportunity to do a self-guided tour. That's what I did. Uh, we went out and just did the interpretive trail on our own. It's okay. Sorry. Sorry about no, you're that. Fine. You're fine. <laughs> um, <coughs> and then we have, um, I mentioned the Totem Heritage Center earlier, and it is unique. There's nothing else like it in Alaska. It's a, um, it was built in the 1970s as a repository 
for totem poles that were rescued and brought back from abandoned village sites. And so we have among the oldest totem poles um, in existence, because as I mentioned, most of them are just allowed to naturally degrade back into the ground, but these were brought in and protected so that we would have uh, the ability to share the history, the traditional carving techniques. And <coughs> it also um, led the way to a resurgence of the native arts. So by having the Heritage Center available, um, Ketchikan was blessed early on with the ability to instruct uh, people in traditional art forms before we lost the elders who were among the last to know them. Um, so we're really proud of that facility and it's always a place that I encourage people to visit um, while they're in Ketchikan. And then there's all of the sort of day tours available as well, right? So a lot of people come in on cruises, they have maybe, maybe if you're lucky, six to eight hours. There's tons of options there too. Yes. Um, we have so many different kinds of sightseeing tours that people can choose from. Uh, traditional coach tours that will take you on bus rides, but we also have, <coughs> excuse me, so sorry. Um, <laughs> we have amphibious craft that will take you mm. on a, a land and sea tour. Um, you can um, go in a classic 55 Chevy. We have Humvees that you can go tour in. Um, and of course, one of the most popular things, quite honestly, that people enjoy doing, and Valerie, I think you said you did it too, is uh, just getting on the bus. And for some folks, just a ride around the community is a nice little tour for them. You get into the residential areas and you get to kind of see a little bit more of the community that way. Um, Ketchikan actually has a free shuttle system that operates uh, in the within the city. It... Uh, stops at all four of the cruise ship docks that are uh, present in the area. It actually goes up to the Totem Heritage Center and then comes back through, stops at the museum and the Creek Street area, and will take you over to what we call the west end of town, which is kind of the shopping area. Um, not so much, you know, the it's not so much a, the visitor kind of geared uh, area, but it is great if you need to get to the grocery store and pick up something that you didn't, you know, remember to bring. Um, and that's all free uh, during the summer months. So that's a great little opportunity for folks to get around on their own. But then um, we also have a historic walking tour, and that is also another very popular excursion. The walking tour maps are uh, printed and can be picked up at our visitor centers, and we have two of them. One is located right smack in the middle of, of downtown near the Welcome Arch uh, on the cruise ship dock. And then we have another one that is a seasonal uh, visitor center that operates uh, between berths three and four. So it's a little bit north of the downtown area by the tunnel. And if you haven't seen our tunnel, that's always kind of a fun thing to go look at, too, because it's uh, unique in the way that it was basically built <laughs> right under a how uh, a neighborhood with houses on it and mm -hmm. all of that. So uh, the walking tour has two options. One will take you traditionally through the downtown area to Creek Street. And then the other one is a more of a West End where you could, you know, you'll walk past some of the salmon uh, processing facilities and just kind of get a better sense of, you know, community life in Ketchikan. Um, so that's another great opportunity. And the map is is kind of the guardians of the map is an organization called Historic Ketchikan. So there's good factual information if you're a history buff. Uh, that's something that people will enjoy. Um, and then we have, you know, we have um, some tours that kind of make use of the industries that we have, of course, fishing, number one. Uh, Ketchikan has five different species of salmon that come through here. As I mentioned earlier, it's starting in around May when the king salmon come back. And then uh, we have species coming all throughout the summer, the silver or coho salmon. Uh, we get chum salmon or, or also known as kita salmon. We have uh, the pink salmon come running through. 
and the uh, sockeye salmon are also available um, in various areas in and around Ketchikan. So if you're a fisher person and you want it, you can go out on a day charter, you can do multi-day trips. Um, we have the capability here for all of your salmon to be uh, processed and and it's flash frozen and stored for you and then shipped home when you want it to be there. So um, that is definitely a, um, a well-oiled machine in catch can is the uh, sport fishing <clears throat> opportunities. Uh, another tour that just opened up um, just before the pandemic, so I consider it new, is uh, a tour of an oyster farm. Ketchikan in the surrounding area has uh, really seen growth in mariculture industry and uh, oyster uh, oyster beds in particular, or oyster uh, farming has become a very popular um, uh, local industry. And we have a company called Hump Island Oysters. They produce, if you're an oyster fan, they produce these beautiful, small, briny, sweet little gems of oysters. And uh, on this tour, you will be taken out to the facility, learn about the whole process. They take you out to the uh, oyster facility where you can see them pull oysters and and then you get to sample them, of course. So that's a yummy one. Yeah, yeah. that's incredible. And as you, you told me, you did a cooking class when you were here. So there are some, uh, we've got a great pub crawl. We've got a, another mm -hmm. um, kind of a foodie tour. Um, there's a lot of people love crab. That seems to be a very big thing. Um, and Dungeness crab in particular is, is traditionally the crab that you would find in our area. So um, you'll be able to enjoy crab and salmon and oysters and all kinds of seafood. So because we all know that, you know, dining is always part of a visit as well. Yeah, I will say Ketchikan is a community that I visited where it doesn't matter what they're serving on the ship if you're coming in on a cruise you want to get at least one meal in when you're on the ground because there's or or a food tour or, or a pub tour which i think the pub tour is pretty new um i follow them on instagram and because there's, there's just some incredible food and drink opportunities right within the core ketchikan area where you can just walk from the cruise ship once you get off your ship yes and we also have two local microbreweries um that are operating and uh, one of them has a tasting room, so you can, that's Bodden Street Brewery, you can go in and check it out. And then uh, just in the last year, our local distillery opened. And Alaska so that's, Uncharted, right? Yes, yes. Yep. And so now they're producing um, adult beverages, and you can go out and go and check those out too, so. <laughs> they're very good. I can attest from experience and they're very friendly. So if you are a craft spirit person, it is one of those fantastic intimate experiences where oftentimes you come in and they're working in the back. You can see into the workspace. You can poke your head around and might get invited in on an impromptu tour if they're not in the middle of something. I've heard stories of that. That's not what happened when we were there, but we got to try everything. And it's a, that's a really fun addition to Catch a Can's food and dining scene as well. Yeah, we're really excited. And, and of course, I mean, you know, we, we're really fortunate in Ketchikan that we have um, a variety of restaurants. So if, uh, you know, salmon isn't your thing, although I don't know why it wouldn't be, uh, you know, you can find Thai or Chinese or sushi. Um, and then also kind of going back into our history, uh, the, the salmon industry actually did see a, a number of uh, groups that kind of ended up immigrating into work in the industry, uh, most notably uh, people from the Philippines, um, people from Japan and China. Um, and the Filipino population here is still very strong, very vibrant. And so we have Filipino restaurants, which is something that maybe not a lot of places have. And I mean, so much so that when you are at the 4th of July or one of our community festivals, you'll, you know, you'll see people lined up that to buy uh, lumpia, which is a similar to like a fried egg roll, mm -hmm. um, pancit, which is a noodle dish and chicken adobo. And I mean, those are all dishes that everybody locally loves and, and enjoys eating. And um, 
so yeah, lots of variety on the food and beverage side of things. And of course, you know, like everybody else in the Northwest, we love our coffee. So you'll never run out of a place to go to grab a latte or <laughs> yeah. something made with uh, locally bre locally roasted coffees, as a matter of fact. So Amazing. Um, okay, so I have a few questions. Is there anything else you want to cover before we jump into questions? Okay. No, I think let's go. Cool. So um, let's start with this one. So it seems like Matt is going to be visiting Ketchikan independently. Um, and just curious whether you need a rental car to get around or can you walk and take buses and do it that way? Um, all of the above, yes. Uh, the road system in Ketchikan is actually pretty limited um, and it's kind of a novelty. We the From downtown, the road goes about 16 miles south and about 18 miles north and they literally end with signs that say the road ends. So if you really want to visit um, the whole the whole community, a car is helpful because then you can do it on your time. Our bus system covers most of the road system in Ketchikan, but not all of it. Um, so, for example, uh, Ward Cove Recreation Area. If you were to take the bus and walk and and want to go there, you're probably looking at a mile and a half walk to get to the to the uh, area. So you might want a car if that was an area that you were going to uh, visit. Uh, we have cabs. Uh, they can be uh, kind of scarce, especially peak visitation days when we've got several cruise ships in port. Uh, we have one or two guys, folks that are kind of doing the Uber Lyft thing. But um, in a community our size, that's probably not your best alternative. Um, and then, of course, uh, just if you want to just stick to the downtown um, area, then, of course, it's very walkable um, and easy to get around. Perfect. Thank you. Um, here's one that came in that's more winter oriented. Um, we you mentioned that maybe Ketchikan isn't as much of a winter sports destination, but some people find themselves visiting anyway with a really good raincoat to make sure they stay dry and warm. Um, do you ever see the Northern Lights in Ketchikan? I know it's the furthest, basically the furthest Southern Alaskan community. So, Yeah, we actually do get a chance on occasion to view the, the Northern Lights. Uh, I will say, you know, in all honesty, that um, because our weather is... Uh, especially in the winter time when they're most visible, we have a lot of rain. And so um, oftentimes this, the cloud cover prohibits you from actually seeing them. But on a crystal cold, clear night, um, oh my gosh, we've seen, we've had some incredible experiences. And, you know, and of course, like most places, you got to get up at two in the morning <laughs> in order to sit and enjoy them. But at least it's not as cold here as it is in some of the areas where you view. And interestingly, we do on occasion see them because we uh, don't have the longest daylight that you would experience in other parts of the state. Uh, we will see the northern lights even in like late summer. Mm. So that's kind of a treat. I wouldn't book your trip on that, but I would say that, you know, it would be a really... It would be a nice experience if it happens while you're here. Yeah, that's the same advice we got. If you are also going to watch the Sitka seminar, that was the same advice Lori over in Sitka gave is <laughs> don't plan your trip to see the Northern Lights here, but if it's clear and the lights are active, it's a fantastic show. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Okay, I have one more question because you actually covered some of the questions that I received in your talk, so we're doing pretty well. So here's one more to round it out. Um, are there thrift shops? Can you go thrifting when you're in Ketchikan? Absolutely. We have uh, two thrift shops um, that are operated by nonprofits. Um, we have one, the Salvation Army operates one. We also have a, a local uh, senior center that also has a thrift shop. And we have a pawn shop. So there are some opportunities there. Uh, we also have an antique store. So sometimes you might find some fun little treasures uh, at that as well. Perfect. So there's definitely unconventional souvenir shops. There's conventional ones and unconventional ones. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like, any parting words of wisdom you'd like to leave for people with regard to visiting Ketchikan this year? 
Uh, well, I will warn you, um, there's going to be some construction going on this year. First of all, the Ketchikan International Airport, if you don't already know this, is actually on a separate island. And so if you fly into Ketchikan, you do have to take a short five-minute ferry ride across to Ketchikan proper. Um, and there is a fee to, uh, you have to pay like $6, I think, if you're walking on and more if you have a car. Rental cars are at the airport and you can bring them across. So that's also something to be aware of if you're thinking about that. But we are currently in the middle of a pretty big expansion of the airport dock, um, parking and the waiting areas for uh, passengers who are getting ready to get on and on the ferry. And that's on both sides, both on the airport side and the town side. So just be aware, you know, look for signs and kind of follow those. And then unfortunately, you know, we have a kind of a short construction season in Alaska. So oftentimes road work will conflict with uh, what's going, you know, with visitation. So we have a project at the very end of uh, out south of town by Herring Cove that we'll be wrapping up. Um, most of you are aware that bridges are being replaced all over the country. We have a couple of bridges now that have also been uh, renovated and, and restored. So one is at Herring Cove and they'll probably be finishing up that project this summer, but we will also have some paving work that's going to be going on uh, right in the middle of town, of course, where we get the heaviest traffic. So just something to be aware of. Great advice. Good to know. And uh, if you're traveling to catch can independently, knowing about that ferry to get to the airport is give yourself plenty of time because you can't just zoom right up to the curb and jump out and run into the airport. There's a bit more involved when you, when you fly in, in and out of catch can. Good advice, Valerie. Yep. Yeah. Well, always want to give yourself plenty of time when you travel in Alaska. Uh, okay. Well, then we will wrap it up. Thank you so much for joining me, Patty. Always a pleasure. Thanks for yeah. inviting me and um, look forward to seeing uh, uh, everybody coming back to Catch a Can this year. Absolutely. And then um, if you are viewing this live or you're watching the replay, thank you so much for joining us and learning more about Catch a Can. If you have any questions, as a reminder, you can place those in the comments right below this video. It is immediately and forever on YouTube. So forevermore, if you have questions about Catch a Can, until we do a new video, you can leave them here. And if I can't answer them myself, I know how to get in touch with Patty to pull her in for extra advice. Uh, and then if you like this video, if it was helpful for you in your planning, please give it a like here on YouTube. That just helps more Alaska travelers like you find resources like this. It's the way these algorithms work that we live under the spell of. Um, and if you like getting Alaska travel advice, give us a subscribe over here. Just hit that subscribe button for Valerie and Valise channel and you will be updated every time I have a new video, including the rest of this seminar series, which while we're over halfway through the series, there are still a few more videos to come next week. And again, thank you for joining me. I hope you have a wonderful time planning your Alaska trip, visiting Ketchikan and exploring the rest of the last frontier. Thank you.